If you need to, you could use it as a weapon if need be. This is Loadout, where we find out what items members of the armed forces use in training and in the field. One of the first things we're going to have is a muzzle. From weapons. Here on my left, I have a M110 semi-automatic sniper weapon system. To uniforms. To some things you might not expect. We went from a box on wheels to a whole freaking kitchen, right? My name is Staff Sergeant Jeffrey Haynes. Today I'm gonna go over the loadout bag for our Army Cavalry Scout, also known as a 72 hour bag. Army Cavalry Scout is the eyes and ears of the battlefield. We go out behind enemy lines and we report all information to the commander so that the ground commander can make the best decision to fight the fight. So in the bag, you will have some of your sustainment items, such as your MREs, or your, also known as your meals ready to eat. All right, they all come in bags. You just open up the bag and you can eat however you need to. Do you have a preference of MRE? Beef shredded barbecue sauce. Why is that your favorite? Because uh, it comes with an awesome cookie. Really good cookie. And then in my other pouch that I always have ready to go, I have my map markers. It allows us to draw out the graphics for all the operational portion of the mission. This is just basic notes. So if I ever forget my formulas, it's just something to have all my formulas in. It has my range cards, all my just don't forget stuff. And then in my Ziploc bag, I'll usually have my graphics. I keep it in a Ziploc bag so if it rains, it doesn't get destroyed by the moisture. So this right here is what it'll, a basic map would look like with some graphics. These are your NAIs, your enemy positions, the routes, and the boundaries. I got my protractor, so when I need to get grid coordinates or I need to plot my directions, I can know how far I need to go with the protractor. There's a lot of math with a cavalry scout. You gotta know the radius of the curve, the grade of the slope. The next would be calculator. This right here will allow us to rapidly get the correct answer. Then I have your notepad and pen, so you can copy down reports and you can re uh, receive all the information that comes through the radio. Then you'll have your, your nightlight with red lens. You have to use red lens at night because white light will travel further than red lens. That way you're not detected. Because as a cavalry scout, you gotta move undetected behind enemy lines. And then you'll have your extra batteries for the headlamp. Because again, this is a 72 hour bag, so you have to ensure that you can sustain yourself for 72 hours. And then you got your face paint. This is what you'll apply on your face, your hands, your neck, your ears, everywhere. That way you are not detected so easily. And then you have your compass. So it gives you your direction in degrees and mils. And then there's two methods to hold this, compass to cheek, center hold method. So normally what I'll do is I'll hold it up, put it up against my face, I'll, aim, I'll get my degrees and I'll look through my front aperture, see what it's pointing at. If it's pointing at a tree, I'm heading to that tree. And the center hold method is just straight out in front of you. The black line right here tells you which way you're going. And then in the main pouch, I keep my e-tool, my entrenching tool. That way, when I gotta dig my fighting positions or if I have to bury booby traps or anything like that, I have my tool needed. So you extend it all the way out, and then you just tighten down at the handle, and it looks just like a shovel. It has some sharp, sharp and uh, rigid edges, so you can cut down barks, trees, you cut down all that stuff so that you can improve your uh, observation post, your OPs. Could that, could that also be used as a last resort weapon? <laughs> it could in some sense. That's why there's another configuration that is this. If you need to, you could use it as a weapon if need be. I was just having this configuration and hit. Then you got your binos. You got your M22 binos. This right here allows you to see the enemy at a further distance and before they see you. You can also use these binos as a cavalry scout for a call for fire. This is where you call in artillery. This is your ASIP radio. This is what we use as scouts. This is our primary weapon because if we don't have radio, we cannot be the eyes and ears of the battlefield. We cannot communicate. Communication is key as a cavalry scout. My hand mic, this allows me to talk into the radio and listen. And I got my long whip antenna. This allows the radio to get the signal required. You can extend this antenna out just like tent poles. That way 
you can reach further with your signal. So on the ASIP, the first thing you do is you need to make sure it has a battery. So the battery depends on what power on the radio. If you're on high, one battery can get you eight to 10 hours. If you're on low, it can usually last you about 12 hours of battery. Put the cover on, secure it down. First thing I would normally do is I'd put the antenna in. You just twist it around until you find it straight and it just slides right in. And then you start screwing down. Once it's in, I do a little shake because if your antenna is loose, you won't get good signal. Next thing you wanna do is you wanna plug in your hand mic. So inside the hand mic port, there's a little rubber seal. You do have to wet it before you get it on because you need that rubber seal to be lubricated to slide correctly onto the port. You just push in and twist and it just locks in. And then in my rucksack, I will have my wet weather bag. The wet weather bag prevents all my uniform pieces from getting wet or anything from spilling out so it's not a mess in my bag. So in my bag, I always have extra boots because as a Calvary Scout, you will walk a lot. So you always need a pair of boots. <laughs> I'll have extra uniform, always set up, ready to go. So depending on the temperature, I'll bring out seasonal gear so I ensure I don't get sick or cold, or in some cases wet if it's rainy. These are my waffle tops and bottoms. So my thermals, as everybody knows them. I'll have extra t-shirts and I'll have extra socks. Again, as a 19 Delta Cavalry Scout, I'll be using a radio as my main weapon but this will be my alternate weapon in case the enemy gets too close. The M4 is a 5.56 millimeter magazine fed, gas operated, semi-automatic or fully automatic, handheld sheltered fired weapon. When all this is packed back into operation configuration, it is approximately 30 to 35 pounds. I'm Staff Sergeant Andrew Dominguez, and what I have here is a typical sniper loadout that I would take on most missions. Here I have the M2010 enhanced sniper rifle, is equipped with a Mark IV variable scope, from 5 to 25 power. In front of it, I have a and PVS 30. Uh, it lets me see at night with a see-through so it doesn't interfere with my reticle. It's effective out to 1,200 meters. Notable feature is that I have a collapsible buttstock that helps me for transportation. The gun can hold a six round magazine. Here on my left, I have a M110 semi-automatic sniper weapon system. It is also equipped with a Leopold Mark V, three and a half to 18 power magnification. On top of this is a storm mounting bracket with a storm SLX, also to aid me with night operations and also is equipped with a laser rangefinder for ranging targets. It can also hold a 10 to 20 round magazine chambered in the 7.62 millimeter uh, ammunition. Here's my rucksack that I would use for most uh, sniper operations. This would have my standard load. So depending on the amount of equipment that I have in here, I can be anywhere from 35 to 65 pounds without water. So we have a fighting load and an approach load. The fighting load is really going to hold me for that three days or less. And the approach load is what I'm going to use for extended durations. Easily accessible on the outside, I have a ghillie suit that I can use to help me for my infiltration. This particular configuration is set for a rural environment. On the back of the ghillie suit here, I have artificial uh, camouflage known as jute. I also have incorporated 550 cord or paracord that allows me to tie down larger pieces of vegetation. In here I have hair ties that helps me hold in smaller or shrubs of grass. Uh, things I would need to fill in the gaps also when I have the larger plants. When it comes to camouflaging and blending in, a uh, ratio that we go off of is 30-70. 30% of this artificial and 70% natural. And what that does is it lets me rely heavily and adapt to my environment that I'm currently in. And the artificial is just more of a filler. Same thing here for the ghillie pants. Uh, I also have included a zipper for ease of access so I can leave my boots on when taking them on and off. Reinforced stitching in the front, also with uh, canvas or condura. That helps me uh, protect it and the durability of it. It's when I'm low crawling or lower uh, movement patterns. Typically a sniper will have two or three depending on the environments that they work in. I can have one for urban specifically or I can have one for rural. Easily accessible right on top, I have my Bushnell tripod. Also with my sling, it helps me for transportation if I'm carrying it. So the tripod I can use to hold uh, an observation device such as my uh, M151 spotting scope, or I can have uh, my gun clip in here as well. I can use it to assist me in standing or kneeling shots. Here's the spotting scope that I would use for observation. 
it clips right into the adapter, much like a, a camera would on a tripod. The magnification on this is variable from 12 to 40. And this is what I use to aid uh, my shooter getting on target and observing the what we call trace and the fallen for the, uh, for the target engagement. I can also, in an observation setting, I can have this for literally that static observation help me uh, magnify in if need be to positive identification or just get a better picture of what's going on at further distance. Here's our Ashbury tripod, another tripod that we can use for lower level of observation, such as if I'm laying in the prone or in a hide site. So this also would hold my M151 spotting scope. It just clips in with this adapter piece as well. Here's a hog saddle. This right here will clip on with an adapter to my M1 or my Bushnell tripod. What this does is allows me to place an optic or my weapon in here again to help lock in my standing or kneeling positions for shooting. A big tool that we use and rely on is a, is a clipboard. When it holds all my documents or sketches, uh, logs that I will use on a patrol. I have a weather flap here, so I use that to protect it from the elements when I am actively writing or sketching. In sniper school, we're very analog because it has a redundancy. So in the event that I don't have a camera or it goes down, I have the ability to sketch uh, an observation area or objective area. I also have a multitude of pens and markers, pencils. Having a calculator is handy because that will help me uh, with the mill relation formula that I use. Mill relation formula is a, a math problem that we will use to figure out the distance to a target. So it takes the constant of 25.4, I times it by my target size in inches, and then I divide that by the mill reading that I have, which will give me my distance in meters. Most snipers will have either 100 mile hour tape or electrical tape. It's more of a, I'd rather have it and not need it than need it and not have it. A tape measurer also. I need to know target size in inches. If I have something on the spot that is near me, which is the same out in distance, I can use that as a reference point. And if I had maps or any other uh, topographical aids that I would use, that would be in here as well. Really accessible, I like to have a multitude of rear bags or shooting bags. They call it a rear bag because of the position that I hold it. It goes at the end of the buttstock, and I will use my non-firing hand to hold it. And it helps me make those real finite, minute adjustments, raising or lowering an elevation. Uh, a lot of people will make these by putting popcorn kernels, airsoft beads. Uh, you can get these professionally made or you can make them yourself. Always have to have an MRE in the bag too. So these are meal ready to eat. Come with a main side, our main dish. There's a side carbohydrate, uh, starch, and a protein item in here as well. And uh, loads of snacks too. You can find Skittles, cookies, and other uh, juice, juice beverage powders. I currently have the meatballs and marinara sauce. It is one of my personal favorites. Here in my bag, I have extra M2010 magazines that I would use just in case one of these breaks or I get a resupply. I have magazines to load those bullets up. Here's a Kestrel 5700. This is a Kester anemometer. It's a weather station along with uh, applied ballistic software in there. This is what I will use depending on the specific round that I'm firing. This will give me the data I need to engage target at distance. I also have your standard issued cold weather gear that I would need for the uh, temperature changes that might happen at, in the evening. We refer to these as a waffle top and a waffle bottom. We say waffle just because of the pattern that, it, that is on it. Are they comfortable? They're okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next I have really accessible is my wet weather gear. Because for that inclement weather or when it starts to rain on me, this will help keep me dry. Here is the parka and the trousers that I have. Uh, the great features on these two is that they are also accessible for me to put these on with the zippers that I can put them on while wearing my, my pants and boots still. And the parka usually comes oversized so that I can still have my, my combat fighting equipment on without having to change anything. Another thing I like to have on the outside, also easily accessible, is the poncho. This is what I will use when I cache my ruck. I can put this over to keep it dry. from and I can also use it for a shelter if need be. In addition to what I would carry, I would be wearing a ballistic helmet and a ballistic plate carrier. Inside here, I'm equipped with ballistic plates that are able stopping uh, certain calibers around. You'll see here magazine pouches and spots for my radio. The ballistic helmet that we have here, there's 
There's Velcro all over it. It's noted for using IR strobes or beacons used to signal your position to other uh, entities that have night vision. Snipers typically would not use anything of that nature unless we were using it on an exfiltration uh, because we're trying to keep a low, low signature and low visual presence. Moving along towards my more survival tools that I would have, I have a water purifier right here. So in the event that I had to egress or escape and evade, I have the means to purify my own water. Uh, when I fully open this up, uh, it attaches to a Nalgene bottle. Uh, the hose goes into my water source and there's a pump on here and would go through the filtration into the Nalgene bottle. Fortunately, I have not had to use this. Survival knife here, I would use this to help me, again, in a survival situation. I can use it to kill small game. Here I have an IR transmitter. So again, if I'm needing to evade, I have the means to signal friendly forces by means of uh, infrared. The package comes with a nine volt battery and an IR beacon that clips right on and every second it will emit a flash. It can be held handheld or I can mount it to a helmet. Here in front of me, I have some other specialized items that I would use for mission specific. Starting on my right here, I will always have, always have a data book uh, and also with what we call a quarterback sleeve. If you notice, it'll go right in, this, right in my forearm here and I can keep uh, shooting data readily accessible. Here, an extra piece of veil. I can use to help mask my, my visual signature. I can put it in front of me or help it to drape over my weapon. Here I have additional or spare uh, paracord or 550 cord. I would use this to help me refine or build a better firing position or I can use this when I have overhead cover. Pruning shears here. Use these for my smaller or thinner pieces of vegetation which what I would use to fill inside my ghillie suit. Here I have a portable handsaw. This is literally a chain from a chainsaw. It has wrist straps and handles and I can just saw back and forth. I can use this to cut down larger pieces of lumber or thicker trees that my pruning shears will not be able to handle. I can use it to help me uh, conceal my position in the rural environment. Face paint I would also use to apply this to help me blend into uh, rural surroundings. I would say it's similar to what you'd find at a, uh, a party city when you do costume face paint, hunting face paint as well. Here in front of me I have a few items that I would use for an urban setting. I have various lengths of screen I would use to help conceal my position. With that, metal clamps to help me uh, hold these securely. And that is all the gear a U.S. Army sniper could use on a mission. Stand clear. We went from a box on wheels to a whole freaking kitchen, right? The containerized kitchen provides the Army with the ability to perform large-scale feeding and everything that we need to prepare up to 800 meals three times a day. My name is Staff Sergeant Nicholas Davis. I'm an Advanced Culinary NCO at Joint Culinary Center of Excellence, Field Operations Training Branch. Today, I'll be going over all the equipment that an Army Culinary Specialist uses on the containerized kitchen. An Army Culinary Specialist is someone who has been certified to perform culinary duties to support the United States Army and all of their feeding needs. Now here is our cooking center. We've got these grates right here that allow us to suspend our cooking pots or pans above our modern burner unit. Our modern burner unit generates about 52,000 BTUs. All right, that's a lot of cooking power. We can fry, saute, boil, anything we need to on this portion of the containerized kitchen. Right here is our cooking pot. Cooking pot is nestled in the cooking pot cradle assembly. What this does is it contains the heat from the modern burner unit around that pot. This is a 15 gallon pot, and as you can imagine, trying to boil 15 gallons of water will take quite some time. This right here is gonna cut that time down and reduce the risk of people getting burnt or heating up the area unnecessarily. Right here, we've got a large griddle. You'll see around it, we've got a splash guard, pancakes, bacon, eggs, sausage, steak, hash browns. 
you name it, we can do it here on this griddle. I've actually gone so far as to do like a hibachi grill. Underneath the griddle is my grease trap. This piece right here just slides out. Anything that I scrape off will funnel into there and I can discard it. Over here, we've got a convection oven. It works much the same way as a gas oven that you'll find in your house. We're gonna use our modern burner unit underneath as our heat source. Inside is a large fan on the back that's gonna force that heated air around, regulate the temperature inside the oven, and decrease our cooking time, increasing our potential yield. Next to it, we've got a tray pack heater. It is exactly what it says it is. When we don't have the capacity to hold food in a refrigerator, we're gonna use the UGR heat and serve ration. That UGR heat and serve ration comes in the form of food, shelf stable, contained in heat resistant plastic trays. We'll load this up with up to 24 tray packs, add water, let that heat warm those tray packs through. Next to the tray pack heater, we've got a fully functioning sink, running water, heated, that'll drain outside. There's the ability to run soap through it. So now, as you're cooking, you can clean your hands, you can wipe out, wipe, rinse off your, your vegetables, fruits, all right? Wipe out your utensils. Here in this corner, we have a warmer, a warming cabinet. Now, this warming cabinet is so critical to the function of the containerized kitchen. We can cook all day long, but I need some way to hold my food safely, maintain that temperature prior to serving it to my personnel. This warming cabinet affords me the option to cook a large amount of food, keep it at a maintained temperature outside the temperature danger zone, and continue on with my cooking process. Next to my warming cabinet, going in the opposite way, I've got two industrial refrigerators. Now we'll talk about how we serve. We can configure our cooking center to be a serving line. I'm gonna remove these grates. We're gonna exercise caution when removing these because these will be hot if I've been cooking on them. So I'll slide this off, just get it out of the way. I'll grab my serving line divider Place that on top right there. This is designed to fit any standard size pan. I can put them in here and I can serve hot food or I can put ice in there and serve cold food if necessary. Can't do it at the same time though. I've got shields here on the backside of my cooking center. Those shields are removable. These shields act to keep all the heat from these multiple cooking surfaces on this side of the kitchen. Up above here, I've got my industrial hood vent system that's gonna vent out excess heat, diesel exhaust. But also, over here, I've got two large industrial fans that are also going to vent excess hot air out of the containerized kitchen. Now, once we remove as much of the hot air as possible, I can turn on my ECU or environmental control unit. That's my air conditioning. I can cool my cooking area down a little bit to make it a little more comfortable for today's Army culinary specialists. This side is gonna be for our serving. We're gonna prep, we're gonna serve uh, things like salad, uh, desserts, beverages. Over here, we've got some insulated food containers for storage. We've got insulated beverage containers or dispensers. Right here, we've got a 10 gallon and a 15 gallon pot that we're gonna use for cooking. You'll notice right here, we've got some tray slides. So as people come through and they get their food, we got a little spot for them to rest their trays. 
So starting over here, we'll go over the assortment of cutlery that comes with the containerized kitchen. We've got our paring knife. Standard three inch paring knife. We've got our six inch utility knife. Utility knife or the rigid boning knife. This right here, sure some of y'all are familiar with, all right? Michael Myers, this is a 10 inch chef's knife. Now this right here, we're gonna do a lot of our major cutting. We got ribs, we gotta cut up a lot of vegetables. This is the knife that we're gonna use for that. We've got a scimitar or a steak knife. Long, used for cutting meat. A lot of times we'll get large pieces of meat. We gotta break them down, make them a little bit smaller. All right, we'll use this to cut that. What kind of large meats do you get? We have what's called a steamship round, which is basically the, the hind quarter of a cow. We'll cook that up. All right, car, carve that. Prime rib, turkeys, things like that, pork roast. Any of those large cuts of meat that we may get, uh, we're gonna use our scimitar knife to cut those up. And then to ensure that all of our knives keep a straight edge, we've got a, a butcher steel that we can use to make sure that we do all of our cuts properly. Next, I've got my heavy duty neoprene gloves. We use these gloves when we're pulling stuff out of hot water. So when we're preparing our meals, more often than not, our water's gonna get up to about 170, 180 degrees. Uh, we don't wanna go too much higher than that boiling. That increases the risk of burning yourself and is going to uh, increase the evaporation of the water and increase our water consumption rate. We've got a can opener, standard everyday can opener that you see at your house, but we open a lot of big cans. Our slotted spoon, standard serving spoon, 15 inch serving spoon. When that one won't cut it, we've got our 21 inch serving spoon. A lot of times if we've got a, a large amount of food that we're serving, we've got big pans that we're gonna serve out of. All right, this is gonna be beneficial to get back into the corners, serve the same purpose as the other one. You just get a little more reach out of it. Next is our skimmer. So with our skimmer, this is used to skim stuff off the top of stocks. I can actually also use this if I just wanna strain something out. Here, I've got an assortment of food turners. So this long food turner, I'm gonna use this for something more like eggs, um, if, I, if I got pancakes, so I can get in on the side of it, use that, and I can flip it over. This food turner with that rounded front, I'm gonna use this for something a little more sturdy. If I'm cooking steaks or bacon or something like that, I'm gonna use this, get in there, I can flip it over, all right, a lot more sturdy. This food turner, probably one of the best ones we have. All right, heavy duty, I can use this to scrape my griddle as well as flip my steaks, eggs, burgers. Anytime I'm cooking meat, I'm looking for one of these food turners. My baker scraper. I'm gonna use my baker scraper. I use this to clean my griddle. I use it to clean my tabletops. Depending on what type of rations we have, I may get up on here, make bread, cookies. I'm gonna use my baker scraper in the same way that I would use it in a regular kitchen. This is our food scoop. We're gonna use this anytime we have something that might stick to the spoon, things like ice cream or mashed potatoes, refried beans, softer vegetables like spinach. We'll use that so we can get it in and ensure that everyone gets a proper portion size. Next, we have our tongs. Anytime we wanna grab something, we're gonna use our tongs. Next is our serving fork. I use this much in the same way as tongs. For things that are a little bit closer, a little bit smaller, I'll use my 15 inch fork. I've got my 21 inch fork. Especially when I'm using my large griddle, I'm gonna use this 21 inch fork. Next is my whisk. So this right here is a rigid whisk. You can tell the tines on are a little bit thicker. I can also use this to add air to stuff if I wanna make things like meringues or whipped cream. Next, I've got my rolling pin. Everybody knows what a rolling pin is for, but here we use it for a few other things. We use our rolling pin to break up ice for when we pre-chill our insulated food containers. We have a four quarter pitcher. When you're preparing food for 800 personnel, you don't have time for small measuring cups. Four quarter pitcher is gonna allow us to scale out, to measure out large amounts of liquid. If you don't need to go quite so big as four quarts, this is a one quart dipper. We're gonna use this to help transfer food from our large cooking pots 
to our serving dishes. Next, we have an eight ounce ladle. Now, precision is everything. We have a set of measuring spoons. We're gonna use our measuring spoons to ensure we're getting the right measurements according to those recipe cards. Everything we do is hot. So we've got our hot pads. We're gonna use these hot pads when we're moving hot pans, we're removing stuff from the oven. I'll even use my hot pad sometime when I'm cleaning my griddle, just to give myself a little bit of protection from that hot stuff that's on the griddle. I've got a variety of serving pans. This is a half pan. Anyone who's worked in food service can identify this as a six inch half pan. We'll store food in here to serve it. We can prepare food in here even. Step up from the half pan is our six inch line pan. Some people may know it as a hotel pan. This is a six inch line pan. And that's all the equipment that a U.S. Army culinary specialist uses in our containerized kitchen. If uh, a sailor does end up out at sea in the water for whatever reason, they can actually slap some air into the collar and then use it as a sort of flotation device to help the sailor stay afloat. My name is HM1 Andrin. I will be going over all of the different uniform items that every sailor is issued in their sea bag. A sea bag is an item that is issued to every sailor during their night of arrival, um, and it stays with them throughout their Navy career. The first item in the sea bag is the Navy PT uniform. PT is physical fitness. The Navy PT uniform consists of the PT shirt, as well as the blue PT shorts. So gold and blue, the Navy colors. It has silver reflective lettering for safety issues. It's 100% polyester with a very thick collar that tends to choke you while you run. They each have a pocket on each side and then on the inside they have a ID card holder. The shoes sailors wear with PT uniforms are any shoe that is complementary to the uniform that's not too flashy, but it's an athletic style shoe. The next item is the service dress whites, which you'll notice as I take these out, they are folded inside out to keep the integrity of the main crease in the front and then especially the three creases on the back collar. They're very tight, crisp creases, which is part of the tradition of the uniform um, to have a neat appearance while you're wearing the uniform. The service dress white trousers as well are also folded inside out um, because the creases on each side of the leg, as worn, the creases go in instead of out, which is why they're folded inside out. So the male version of the service dress white trousers for males have both belt loops and two front pockets and two back pockets. Uh, the female version does not have any belt loops um, or pockets. So the service dress whites, you wear black Oxford shoes. There's a couple other components to the service dress whites, which is the neckerchief, which gets tied underneath the collar and then in front um, into a square knot. And then also the white hat, also known more commonly as the Dixie cover. So there's actually some surprising history behind this style of cover. It was introduced while sailors were in tropical climates, and then they were actually able to fold the brim down so they could dissipate any water from rain in those tropical climates, um, as well as if it's up, um, so it could be used to collect water, and then the sailors could drink from their covers um, to, to stay hydrated in those climates. Is it one size fits all? It's not one size fits all. It's sized while they're here. Then you can adjust the size as needed in the future. They do have to be replaced quite often. How do you keep that uniform so white? Uh, very carefully. It's, uh, whenever you drink coffee, for example, you gotta lean forward and hold your neckerchief and uh, you, you don't really wanna sit down. Everyone's pretty afraid to sit down and, and ruin their dress white uniform. Uh, because it, it is very hard to keep clean. Every service member is responsible for their own upkeep, whether that's bringing it to a dry cleaner or cleaning it themselves and ironing in the creases. You get a yearly uniform allowance to replace and upkeep uniform items. I've never cleaned them myself because of the specific care that's needed when they are cleaned. So the next item is the service dress blue uniform, which again, similar to the service dress whites, is folded inside out to keep the integrity of those creases. So this is the oldest, most iconic uniform that the Navy has. Introduced in the 1800s, whereas the service dress whites were introduced around World War I. It's the same type of collar with the creases in the back, just like the whites, two stars in the white piping in the back. 
The service dress blue trousers have lacings in the back. Uh, the lacings, it used to have, when this uniform was first introduced, lacings all around. However, they would snap or break. Um, so they replaced them with buttons in the front. So they kept the, the laces, uh, but then they added the buttons in the front, the 13 buttons, which started off at seven buttons. And then it was told that it was uncomfortable for sailors that had to use the bathroom. The Navy made it a little bit easier to use the restroom. It's really only one button at the top. And now there's a, a hidden zipper that you can use. And then these buttons are just fake now. The next uniform that we'll talk about is the Navy Working Uniform Type 3, which is the camouflage uniform, or a lot of us call it camis. So this working uniform is the standard working uniform that most every sailor wears at a day-to-day -day basis, whether it's a ship that's in port, sub that's in port, uh, any shore duty command. This is a 50% cotton, 50% nylon material, much more breathable than the former Type 1 material, which is the, the blueberries or the blue camouflage that we used to have up till a few years ago. So a little bit easier to, to breathe, especially in the summer. It has four buttons in the front, a fifth if you are in battle dress mode uh, with a Velcro collar. So these are the Navy Working Uniform Type 3 trousers. Again, it has one main button in the front and then four hidden buttons um, on a strap behind that. So it has two standard front pockets, like on most, most trousers, um, two cargo pockets, and then two ankle pockets that are Velcro on each side, and then two more back pockets. The cover for the NW's Type 3 is the eight point cover, which has eight physical points, like a stop sign on the top, um, and then a Navy Ace on the front. The hardest part about this cover is to keep the integrity of those eight points and so they don't fold in on themselves. Um, so it looks pointy and sharp as you wear it. What some sailors do is they'll actually put cardboard or a plastic insert into the cover to keep, to help hold the integrity of those eight points and make it look crisp. The footwear is for shipboard is generally the black leather boots. So the next uniform item is the coveralls. This set that's issued is, is really only worn in boot camp. The, the set that sailors wear out on ships is actually called the FRV or a fire resistant version of the coveralls. So this uniform is worn on ships or submarines while underway. Um, and I need shipboard deployments. That's really the only spot where it's worn is on ships. So this material is mostly polyester and then some cotton in it. This material is not very breathable um, with intention. Uh, so if uh, a sailor does end up out at sea in the water for whatever reason, they can actually slap some air into the collar and then use it as a sort of flotation device to help the sailor stay afloat. The only downside to this uniform uh, for some sailors is that it's a one piece. So if you need to use the head or the bathroom, um, you need to take everything off whereas you can't just drop your trousers. The footwear is the same black boots that they would wear with their NW Type 3s. The last item is the Navy service uniform. So this is not actually stowed in the sea bag. It's just hung up on a hanger. That's how we teach our recruits to stow it. So this uniform is worn at a more formal command um, as an instructor duty, as a recruit division commander, most admin jobs at shore commands, any office type job that sailors might work at. This shirt just has two breast pockets. Some sailors call it peanut butters because of the black trousers on the khaki shirt. Um, a little bit different than as an E7 or above. Um, they would also wear khaki pants with it and they would just call them service khakis. So the trousers for this, two side pockets and two back pockets, uh, very similar to the male service dress whites, again with the belt loops. Um, the females is also similar, whereas there is no belt loops and there's no pockets. And then the garrison cover, which is worn with the Navy service uniform. We call this the, the pizza slice here in boot camp. So this cover is worn uh, with that pizza slice forward, rank insignia on the left side, um, about one inch above your eyebrows, uh, squarely on your head. It feels like it's about to fall off, especially on a windy day. Um, there is some tradition, especially with Airedales or air, different air rates where um, they put a little whale tail in the back of the cover. From what I've heard from those people that wear their cover with the, uh, with the little whale tail in the back, is uh, while they used to wear these covers on the flight deck or during flight operations, um, they would wear a headset on top of their cover, which would create that crease in the back. Has it ever blown off of your head? Uh, several times. I tend to march or, or walk with my, uh, my hand holding my cover the whole time so it doesn't blow off. I'll give you my personal rankings of my 
opinions of these uniforms. So the least favorite would be the coveralls. Um, I'm not a shipboard sailor. I'm a greenside sailor. So I've never worn these during my jobs. My favorite would be the NW Type 3s because it's the most comfortable. It's what comes to mind when I think of the armed forces. I think of all the branches wearing their camouflage uniform. And again, it's very comfortable, very breathable. I think it's a good uniform. So that's it. That's all six uniforms that every recruit is issued during Navy boot camp. You take your hat off. Once you put it down, you want to make sure that the brim is as flat as possible. Once you make sure the brim is as flat as possible, you'll close the cover and then you'll basically tighten it. My name is Staff Sergeant McLean and this is every item in a drill sergeant's uniform. All right, so the first uniform is going to be the Army Physical Fitness uniform. So first item we have is our short sleeve shirt. Uh, here at the Drill Sergeant Academy, we wear an organizational shirt and a lot of organizations are the same. So here on the back, we have our Drill Sergeant logo and then on top of it, we have our name as well. So DSL standing for Drill Sergeant Leader. On the side uh, here at the Academy, we have what's called a run club. So here it says 70 miles. To achieve 70 miles, all you gotta do is run 70, 85, or 100 miles uh, within a month to put it on your uniform. Next up, we have our long sleeve shirt. Similarly, as the short sleeve, name on the back, Drill Sergeant logo. Uh, front, Drill Sergeant logo with the USA DSA on it, standing for United States Army Drill Sergeant Academy. All right, next up, we have our uh, physical fitness trunks, our shorts. We have very standard shorts, has Army on the front and left uh, pocket, and then at the inside, the spandex, you have a part for your ID as well. During the winter months, again, same concept as a shirt and the long sleeve. However, this is a sweater, so same concept. USA DSA on the front with the Drill Sergeant logo, and then also on the back, name at the top with the Drill Sergeant badge right below it. And then the very last piece before we get to the shoes is our Drill Sergeant vest. It's blue and yellow reflective uh, with our names right across the front, uh, front and back piece of the top reflective belt. We are known for having our reflective vests. You can identify any drill sergeant across the field, across the parking lot, just by our vest alone. And then finally, we have our standard issue shoes. Not much to really talk about, just regular running shoes to kind of complete your uniform. So next up, we have our OCP Army Combat Uniform. Our OCP standing for Operational Combat Pattern. Just for clarity, OCP is the pattern. ACU is the uniform, Army Combat Uniform. So first up, on our Army Combat Uniform, we have our top, all right, this is our jacket. On our jacket, we have several key things that kind of distinguishes us from everyone else. So obviously we have our name uh, as worn on the right, and then U.S. Army on the left. Above the U.S. Army, we have uh, badges that we may have occurred over the time span of our careers. Uh, same thing with the pockets. On the very right badge is our drill sergeant badge. Uh, every drill sergeant who graduates this academy earns the right to be called a drill sergeant and is issued a drill sergeant badge. Uh, something else that is very unique to the drill sergeant academy is on the left pocket, we have what's called an instructor badge. Here at the academy, our drill sergeant leaders are essentially instructors of drill sergeants. Next up, we have our pants. Pretty standard cargo pants has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pockets, six on the side and two in the back. At the very bottom, we have our blouses, so you can pull them tighter to make them uh, give that more of a blouse look uh, when you're wearing your boots. All right, next up, we have our boots. Standard issued combat boots uh, to complement your uh, OCPs or ACUs. The color of our boots is coyote brown. So it's the only authorized color that we can wear within our ACU OCP uh, uniform. And then underneath your ACU top, which is what I have on here, uh, you have your tan t-shirt. Uh, basically, that's your Coyote Brown t-shirt that you'll wear as an undergarment uh, to kind of complete this uniform. So here at the Drill Sergeant Academy, we wear Drill Sergeant belts. So our belts is what signifies uh, who we are and it tells everyone that, hey, we are a Drill Sergeant leader. Drill Sergeants on the trail who are not here at the academy instructing, they get their hat and their badge 
when you come up here to be a drill sergeant leader and you go through your certification process, you earn uh, the right to wear the drill sergeant belt. Uh, there are different colors of the belt, different stages. You start out with the tan belt, and then as you progress to senior drill sergeant, you get this belt right here. Uh, the only difference between myself and the senior drill sergeant is I am the Drill Sergeant Academy's uh, DSOR, which is the drill sergeant of the year. So I also wear a green belt. Everyone in the academy who is currently a drill sergeant, whether it be the commandant, deputy commandant, the chief instructors, which are the first sergeants, all wear the campaign hat and the belt. So the next uniform we're gonna talk about is the Army Green Service Uniform, AGSUs, more popularly known as the pinks and greens. So first up, we have our brown coyote boots, our Oxfords that we wear. The socks that we wear with this particular boot is the same color, more or less. And next up, we have our pants. Our typical dress pants that you know you would find in any other men's warehouse. With the pants, when you're wearing them, uh, you want no more than two creases or two breaks, excuse me, at the bottom of your pants. So as you're wearing them, that's a break, that's a break. That's it, no more than two breaks. All right, next up, we have our uh, belt that we use with this particular pants. Uh, no really set way of putting it together. However, you want no more than two inches of excess once you put the belt into configuration. Next up, you have your long sleeve and short sleeve uh, shirt. Both shirts uh, have our ranks stitched on both sleeves. In the summer months, when it gets hot, um, we do have the option of wearing what we call tropical uniform, tropical variation of the uh, pinks and greens, where we will wear the shirt, the pants, belt, shoes, uh, and then our name tapes and the top six awards uh, will go on our top of our left breast pocket. Next up, we have our tie. Uh, pretty standard issue tie. There's three different type of knots that are authorized when we're wearing our pinks and greens. One is a, a half Windsor, two full Windsor, and the last one is four in hand tie. So finally, we have what we call our overcoat which is the highlight of the uniform. Um, it shows all of our awards and decorations. It makes the, completes the uniform over time. On the left side, we have all of our awards that we are awarded, um, as well as any badges, same as our OCP uniforms as I'm wearing now. On the right-hand side, we are authorized to have a foreign badge, one foreign badge on our uniform. This particular foreign badge is the Norwegian Ruck Marches. To earn this badge, uh, you gotta ruck 18.6 miles. Now there's other badges out there as well, i.e. foreign jump wings and things of that nature. On the coat as well, there is a belt that's already built in to give you that more of a tapered look. So typically we would wear this for uh, ceremonial purposes. What are some ceremonies that you would wear? So as a drill sergeant, we would typically wear these during uh, graduations, uh, during family days, uh, maybe in processing pickup, uh, we would wear our pinks and greens uh, just to show them, hey, look, this is what right looks like. So to top off uh, the pinks and greens, a drill sergeant, obviously we're known for our drill sergeant hat, our campaign hat. So um, we are authorized to wear our campaign hats uh, with our pinks and greens. Uh, every drill sergeant uh, is not necessarily issued a hat press, sort of like this one. Um, however, it is highly recommended for each drill sergeant to get a hat press in order to protect their hats from the elements. Um, hat presses ranges anywhere from um, $80 to $150, um, and you can get them as personable as possible. This is basically a standard issued hat press, um, and most drill sergeants, if not all, like myself, um, have two, one that's standard issue and one that's more personalized. So like for my personal one, I have my name, I have um, air salt badge, airborne badge, uh, and a few other things that are on it as well that makes it personable to me. How does it work? So basically, um, every mechanism is different. However, for this one, you'll unscrew it, you'll take your hat off, you'll tuck the straps in, once you put it down, you want to make sure that the brim is as flat as possible. Once you make sure the brim is as flat as possible, you'll close the cover, and then you'll basically tighten it. 
how often do you use it? It is recommended for a drill to use it every day. Um, as soon as you get home, go ahead and throw that hat in the hat press. Um, for me, every chance I get, uh, if it rains outside and I don't have my hat cover uh, to protect it from the rain and from the elements, as um, soon as I get inside, I'll throw it in the hat press just to make sure that it maintains that flat brim. And this is every item that a drill sergeant wears. My name is I'm in one Hollingsworth, and today I'm going to go over the loadout that a military working dog handler would have. Canine handlers will go out on patrol duty and they act as a deterrence. They may be called to assist with narcotics detection. If we get a bomb threat, just provide some detection, do a sweep. So we use them for whatever the mission set requires. So today we'll go over some equipment that you're going to see out in the field as a military working dog handler. And then second, some of the medical equipment that we also have to make sure that our dogs are safe in case of an emergency happens. Uh, one of the first things we're going to have is a muzzle. So for the military working dog, whether that's downrange or stateside, uh, we're going to use this to make sure that the dog is safely uh, able to be cared for in case of an emergency and uh, traveling to and from a location. Each military working dog has their primary reward. Most of the time it's either a, a Kong or a Kong with a rope. It's used to reinforce uh, desired behaviors. So when they do a good job, whether that's obedience tasks, patrol, or when they find a source of odor, then we reward them with this reward object, which is the Kong. Uh, another reward object is a PVC pipe. Uh, this is the tug reward object. So different objects they make it to where I can manipulate the reward in different ways to shape behaviors. With a clone with a rope, at certain areas, I may be only able to grab it and at a certain manipulation. But for this, I can grab and guide them in different directions and shape behaviors that way. So for our toolkit, the other thing that we'll use is different size leashes. So you'll have leashes ranging from uh, 30 feet, six feet, 15, 10, and then our standard six foot leash. When I go inside of a, a building, I can work a little bit closer. It's gonna be more advantageous for me to work on a six foot leash. We have a retractable leash. We also have these for our military working dogs as well. If used properly, you can again, be in a distance and have your dog work uh, independently further away from you. And when would you use a retractable leash over like a 30 foot rope leash? It can all vary. And if it's easier for me to have it tethered while I have my weapon and I'm surveilling the area, I can also use the retractable in my toolkit if it's gonna help me make sure that my dog can work independently and I can also assist in a different manner. Another variation, you can uh, use a bungee. For this, I could attach it uh, to my uh, body and make it to where the dog is, is next to me. So say if I need to do tactical movements or I'm in a, in a tight area and I need to have two hands to be working uh, in a different area, then I can use my two hands on something else rather than uh, having it dedicated to holding onto the leash for my dog. We deploy to various different locations. Sometimes whether it's uh, extremely cold or if we have uh, extremely hot, uh, we wanna make sure that our dogs paws are taken care of. So we can put these little shoes on them and make sure that their paws are taken care of, especially when uh, for hot seasons and they're on asphalt or a rough period that could uh, scrape up their paws. Next, we have their collar. So different variations, different clasps. Uh, this just goes around their neck and this is what the leash is going to be tethered to. Why are there two different collars right there? Uh, just two different, two different types. Specifically, say if they had the variation with the handle, then you could grab the dog and it's more of a, a tactical area where I can use that in my toolkit if I need to grab the dog quickly instead of going underneath. Next tool we have in our toolkit is our choke chains. So say if I have my dog attached to the flat collar, I might want that to mean something differently than when the dog is on the choke chain. You would use it as a tool to communicate desired or undesired behaviors. What do you exactly mean by that? So say if my dog was not responding to a specific command. I could communicate with a very light leash tension on via the choke chain. So another piece of gear that we, we might have is going to be our harnesses. So various different styles. Again, this is, uh, allows us to have more tactical maneuverability. We can use the handles during different situations to again, manipulate our dog. If it works, it's also uh, something we use as a, as a training tool. So say if I'm trying to do uh, drive building activities with my dog, I can use this as something to make it to where the pressure and the tension is more on their body instead of uh, manipulating their uh, head in a specific way. Other gear that we have in our bag is going to be uh, these doggles. This is going to be used to protect the dog's face or eyes. Say if the dog's on like a helicopter or different things like that, they might be used. 
The other thing that we're gonna have in our, in our bag is going to be our water. So we always make sure that we have water for our dogs. Uh, they're gonna be working for us, so we gotta make sure that they're, they're taken care of. We have various different bottles that we can use, and then also our water bowls that we can have to plop it down, pour the water in, and ensure that they're taken care of after working all day. This right here is just, again, uh, just a normal plastic bowl. You can take this apart, put the water in there, easily to take apart and clean. And that's it for this bag. So this is gonna be our basic medical equipment that we carry for our military working dog. Inside, one of the first things you're going to find is our uh, thermometer for our dog. It's very important that we understand our military working dog's ideal working temperature to see if it's either lower or higher than normal, because that's gonna give us a strong indication on how the dog is gonna be able to perform and if it needs to seek medical attention. There's many different thermometers that we can use. Uh, this one specifically is a rectal thermometer. This is gonna be our safety gloves. Uh, the times that we're gonna be using these is if I need to uh, an open wound or something like that, or if I want to make sure that I don't have any uh, debris or bacteria on my hands. Uh, other things that we're gonna find in our kit is gauze. So we'll use this along with the tape. Uh, if there's a sore, a cut, a laceration, uh, we'll make sure that we do that first aid, first initial treatment, and then get them to a veterinary facility as soon as we can. Uh, in the field, we also have uh, various different equipments where if the dog's having breathing problems, I can also do uh, an emergency trach until we can get them to a veterinary specialist. Other things we have in this kit, we make sure that we groom them and take care of their nails and coat. So if their nails are getting too long, we have our clippers to make sure that they're taken care of. Why is it important to make sure that their nails aren't too long? One, just for safety, and then also uh, so they're able to maneuver and able to perform their job. And then taking care of their coat, obviously for uh, sanitary reasons, make sure that they're staying safe and, and healthy. Do the dogs like to be brushed? Some dogs more than others, but if they're going to be in our program, we do make sure that they're comfortable having the muzzle being put on them and also with being pet. So certain dogs are like it more than others. In case we're trying to take off say a harness, if there's an injury or something, we also have scissors to, to cut as well. Take off bandages and open things up as well. The other thing we're gonna have is a different material for a, a splint. So in case the dog injures their leg, uh, we can stabilize that and make sure it's not gonna go anywhere again until we can get them to a professional that can take care of their, their leg. When we are out in the training environment or deployed, we use these doggy bags to ensure that we pick up after our military working dogs as well. Some other things that we would have is the bags of food uh, that we would have with us. The other thing is our military worker dog collapsible kennel. So the collapsible kennel is utilized by being a safe place that I can transport the military working dog in, whether that's in a vehicle or a aircraft. Do it now, let's go. Me up. Your backpack that's on the table. Next, you're gonna open your box up, open it up. Hang it on your box, there's a lock on it, it has a chain on it, you're gonna wear it like a necklace, just put it on, let's go. I am Pedro Zacomo, and tonight I'm going to be going through and explaining every item that new recruits receive here tonight in their Diddy box, Great Lakes RTC Night of Arrival. Diddy is going to be the first issue of uniform items that new recruits receive once they come here to Great Lakes RTC for basic training. It's going to be uniform items, hygiene products, and shoes, anything that they might need here, basic necessities that they need throughout boot camp. So what was your memory of Diddy issue? What was it like when you went through it? For me personally, it was very shocking because I've never had to move this fast, like getting dressed and putting on all these different outer garments and weathers and covers and hats and things like that. Well, first thing we're gonna start with, we'll start with the socks. They're pro feet, moisture socks, keeping your feet from sweating. Just cotton athletic socks, yes. Do you get any more like thicker socks since it does get real cold here in, here in the Chicago area? Um, no, they just um, able to put two pair on if it gets too cold. The next item will be shoes. They get brand new pair of shoes so that everyone have a similar brand shoe. They use these shoes during PT sessions, doing outside runs, inside runs at Freedom Hall. So now they have an option of wearing tennis shoes throughout boot camp. These are SAS running shoes, but we have like three or four different options. Next, we're going to go in what's called the knit bag. The knit bag is where we collect the laundry. But for now, we're holding all the items that they're going to be issued here at night of arrival. Inside the large knit bag, we have sweats. We call them Smurfs here at um, Great Lakes RTC Boot Camp. And it's basically just a sweatsuit, top and bottom. Your Smurfs is just a funny nickname because 
they all look like little Smurfs walking around base. All right, next here we have PT shorts. These are what they use when they go to Freedom Hall to do workouts, when they do the little exercise in-house. They're just basic shorts with little pockets on it. The ID card holder that's on the inside here. The way they can put their little ID in there when they're wearing them. They don't have to have a whole wallet or carry in their hand or anything like that. They also use these when they go and do the initial swim. Really? Yes. They don't have a bathing suit or like swim trunks. No. Next item would be the yellow PT shirt. These shirts are used for PT with the PT shorts that we received earlier. Just a cotton material with the navy on the front left. Big navy in the front back. The collar's not too tight to me personally. I know they just did an upgrade, so they got a new shipment in. I don't know if it's just the fabric or the material they use or if they switched it, but I have not had any issues with the shirts myself personally. Next, we have the brown t-shirts, the coyote brown. These here are gonna be the one that you wear under your type three, which is the uniform that I'm wearing now. It's a cotton t-shirt and you just wear it under your type threes. Next here we have the skivvies known as underwear and they're just a basic plain white underwear for the male and female recruits to wear. Later on in boot camp you are able to buy regular boxers if you would like but these are like just standard issued boxers that I mean briefs that every recruit gets once they come through boot camp. Are these comfortable? Are these like I mean they look kind of like what my dad wore in like 1983. Boot camp is temporary it's only the basic things that you need so if you can deal with these for two to three months and then go, go on about your life and get whichever ones you want, these are like the bare minimum that you need. How many pairs of skivvies do you get? You get eight pair. The laundry gets done by the recruits themselves. They have what's called a laundry crew. They collect all the uniform items that they wear throughout the day and they turn it into the laundry crew. Laundry crew have these bags and they just take them up. After they do hygiene, they put them, they do laundry in-house, then they pass it back out later on in the nighttime. Now here is the large white knit bag that I was telling you about earlier. You're gonna stencil this also. And this is also where you put your dirty laundry once you get to the ship. So you're issued it here and you can, once again, you're gonna put your name on it and all your dirty laundry will just go inside. It opens up like a little laundry bag. We have shower shoes. The shower shoes are used for when they're going and take a shower hygiene. They're just little shower shoes so they can go from their rack to the shower and then back and then they can change into their, their socks and their shoes. Next we have the backpack. The backpack is issued because they're going to have multiple items they need to carry. Up next we have the hydration tool, your water bottle, and pretty much you're just going to put your name on it and then you're going to carry this around everywhere you go whenever you leave. That way you're able to hydrate as required. Why is hydration such a big deal? It's, it's a big deal because we do a lot of PT. Even though it's winter time, your body still needs to hydrate. A lot of people think just because it's winter time, I'm not sweating, that I'm not losing water, but you actually are losing just as much as you do in the summer. They have um, the electrolytes and the PD light for muscle recovery to help you with the soreness, and you're able to drink that also inside of here. Next item we have here is going to be the glow belt. Each recruit is issued a glow belt. That way, once they're out by themselves and they're not with the division, they're able to be identified. All it is is it goes around your backpack, or if you don't have your backpack with you, it goes around your waist. And it's just like a little belt so you can be identified when you're walking throughout the streets. Next here we have the garment bag. The garment bag is used to put your dress uniforms in. That way they don't get dirty or any stains or anything like that on it. When you're traveling, when you're walking around, when you're going from different commands, and it just unzips. You put your little um, hangers in there and your dress uniform to go in. You zip it up and then you're able to hang it up to prevent it, them from getting dirty or dust or anything like that on them. They don't get their dress uh, uniforms issued tonight, do they? No, they do that in week two. Next here we have the Blue Jackets manual. It's all the important da dates and history of the United States Navy. And it's for them to read so they can study and have a basic knowledge of what happened with the recruits and sailors before them. Are there like key aspects of that book that every recruit needs to learn fast? Yes, there is, but there's also another book that they are gonna be issued when they take their first test. But this here goes more in depth. The one that they're gonna be get is specifically just for here. Is this something that recruits keep with them uh, after they leave? Or? Yes, me personally, I still have mine. I still have my stamp here with my name on it, division number. 
I still have my whole C bag with everything that I was issued when I was left here. Why do you keep this book? Why do you keep that stuff? It's history. I want to be able to say, hey, I had all these things because I see that things are changing. They don't have things that we had and we don't have things that the ones before us had. So I like to keep part of history with me. Next, we have here the Diddy box with a lot more items in it. The first one here is a small white knit bag. And on the inside of this small white knit bag, we have pens and Sharpies. The pens are going to be standard recruit ballpoint pens. And they're just used for them to fill out all their paperwork, all the information, write down whatever they need to write. Here we have Sharpies. The Sharpies are used to fill out their name on certain items. Later on, when they get their box, they're going to put their name and things on the box, so they're going to use a Sharpie also. Also inside of this bag, you have a plastic bag with a key. They're going to be issued a standard master lock for their personal lock, their personal drawing. They're just going to be able to lock it up and carry the key around. The spare key will be kept with the RDCs just in case they lose the one that they're issued that they keep up with throughout boot camp. This lock is used to keep all their valuables, their personal stuff, their wallets, their IDs, their cash, their money, anything that has value. Next we have the C bag. The C bag is where they're going to put every single item that they're issued tonight here with the exception of their backpack and they're just able to put it inside of here. And it also has a spot for their lock to go on here so no one can get inside and mess with their valuables or they lose anything. It has straps here and they just put them on just like a regular backpack. Is that waterproof? Yes, it, um, it has a little flap in here on the inside so when you go in and close it, you can put this over the top so it doesn't, the water doesn't get on the inside also. Next we have the covers, re recruit ball caps. The first one here is going to be the standard navy recruit ball cap. This is going to be the one that they're going to wear around unless it's inclement weather then they're going to get the watch cap which they're going to wear in cold weather. But this one here is the one that they're going to wear anytime they exit a building. The next one here would be the Navy ball cap. This is going to be the one that they're going to get emotional for once they get to graduation and they get to actually wear the one that says that they're actually U.S. Navy sailor. When do they get that Navy ball? So they have to complete what's called battle station. It's very intense. Um, it's all night. They just pretty much do everything that they were taught in the eight plus weeks and they have to do it all within 24 hours. And they have to go through and complete every single station in order to become a U.S. sailor. And that's when they get to the, actually put this one on. What did that make you feel like to wear that finally after, after uh, going through all that boot camp? Putting on the Navy cap meant that I was part of a bigger force, part of something that was bigger than myself. Just being able to say, hey, the people, the RDCs that trained me, taught me, I'm able to say, hey, I'm part of a, the U.S. Navy just like you are now. Do a lot of sailors get emotional when they yes, that? Yes, absolutely. A lot of sailors, once they're able to put these on, a lot of them lose their voice because they're crying, they're tear-eyed, their eyes are all red. Like I say, it's, it's a big moment for a lot of people. Next here we have a shoe shine kit. Inside this shoe shine kit is going to be all the items that you need to shine your dress shoes and also your, your drill boots you're going to be issued at a later date also. It just has the shoe shine polish, the brushes, everything that you need to make your shoes nice and shiny for your inspections are just walking around base. And you get taught how to shine your shoes? Or do you come in and <coughs> know how to do it with all these tools and materials? A lot of the recruits, once they come in, a lot of them already know because they look it up on YouTube and things like that. But RDCs, at a certain point in time, they also do like mentoring and they teach the recruits how to shine boots on, give them little tips and pointers on how to actually make it look better. Next here, inside another small white knit bag, the first item is going to be a stamp kit. The stamp kit is going to be used for them to put their name on it. It has little letters. They're just going to put their last name on here with the little letters that are provided. Then they're going to put their division number down here in the center. And then they're able to stamp every single item that has a spot for them to stamp it. And that way they can keep up with their stuff, identify their stuff when they're doing laundry or just in case anything gets mixed up while they're doing whatever. Also inside of this bag you have a sewing kit. Just a basic sewing kit so in just in case one of your buttons pop off you can put the button back on. You don't have to send it out anywhere and get it done, so you can do sewing jobs on the spot. And this one here, we have the shoelaces. The shoelaces here are going to be used to tie up some of the items that you're going to be issued later on in boot camp. We fold it a certain way, we put the shoelaces on there and tie it, the way it doesn't come unfolded. The next item <laughs> is chapstick. We have chapstick because you need to keep your lips moisturized from all the water you're going to be drinking. 
the way your lips are not getting crusted and they're not bleeding, you have to go to medical and have to be set back in training also. You also have hair floss for your hygiene, your personal hygiene. Brush your teeth, wash your face, shower hygiene, floss your teeth, the way you're taking care of your personal hygiene. Next we have fingernail clippers. You have fingernail clippers for one reason, because of initial swim. You're required to cut your fingernails to a certain length so when you jump in the pool, you don't scratch up any of the instructors or any other recruit while you're in the pool. Also, the Navy has a standard of how short you should have your fingernails. That way you can keep your and maintain your fingernails to a certain, a certain um, length. Inside the next small knit bag, we have laundry detergent so that they can wash all the uniform items that they're issued. Each recruit is issued one bag and they just collect them all at one time and wash all the stuff together. And this is how they get their stuff washed nice and clean. Next here we have towel, a towel. This towel here is for them to dry off once they get out of the, the shower. Just a plain white basic towel. They're also going to put their name on it because they're going to turn them in so that they can be sent out to the next to be washed. Next here we have in this little knit bag, we have their stationary stuff, papers, envelopes, stamps, the way that they can write letters home, study material, inside the little checkpoint notebook here for inspections, their way that they can have like little cheat sheets. We also, like I say, we have envelopes here and we have a notepad here so they can write notes and letters and stuff home to their family members and loved ones. The last knit bag we have here we have two towels for them to bathe with when they get in the shower for hygiene. Two little blue washcloth towels. Wash their face in the morning, whatever. We have lotion because of the windy weather, the bad weather, stay moisturized, keep your skin nice and moisturized. So we have razors so that every recruit can shave every single day. We also have shaving cream so they can use shaving cream so they don't, their face doesn't get bumped up. They don't have razor bumps or anything like that, so we give them shaving cream so they can shave their face. Here we have body wash. The body wash is so that they can, once again, hygiene. Once a day, they're required to hygiene. When they go to the pool, they hygiene at the pool, and this is the basic soap that they get so they can do their hygiene. Next here we have shampoo. It's shampoo so that they can wash their hair. Like I say, they're going to go to the pool, so when they come back and they want to get the chlorine out the hair, they just have shampoo to wash it. Next we have deodorant. The deodorant is so that they can put on after they hygiene and they're not, once they get done with PT, they're not all sweaty and stinky so that they can all be around each other. We also have toothpaste, basic toothpaste so they can, in the morning, whenever they need to, go and brush their teeth. We also have toothbrushes in the bag. You have two toothbrushes, that way you can change out throughout boot camp. And they're just there to, so you can, recruits can wake up in the morning, brush their teeth before bedtime, brush their teeth, do it whenever they need to. After they do hygiene, they, put them, they do laundry in-house, then they pass it back out later on in the nighttime. The last item inside this bag is a toothbrush holder. Toothbrush holder is just so that they can put their toothbrush inside of this little plastic tube. That way it's not exposed and getting dirty and getting other dirty items on the toothbrush. Keep it clean. So this is all free, right? Like they don't have to pay for this, right? They don't physically pay here. It's taken out of their first check and then eventually it's put back in their check so that they can, they don't have to actually pay for it. These are all the items that they're issued in their duty box on the first night here at Great Lakes RTC. This is everything they're gonna be, they're gonna need the basic necessities to begin their journey at RTC.